as Terry said, this is the, the, the last panel. We, you know, I know we stand between you and the audience, so we'll, we'll keep that uh, in that in mind. But today we're talking about AI law, um, which we've been talking about through the day, and, and particularly as it affects your practice, right, and, and the concerns we have in practice. But we'll have another look at it from a different angle in this panel. Um, we're looking at robot personalities. What are they? Do robots have personalities? Um, ethics. A huge thing that we think about and people should start thinking about now as we design our technologies. Uh, are these things embedded with ethics? Um, regulation, um, which is more than just the black letter law. It's things like nudging and soft law and, and those sorts of things. Risk management and the new legal frontier. So. With that in mind, let's introduce our, our stellar panel. Um, and there is, a, there is a French theme flowing through this panel. <laughs> um, <laughs> firstly, um, uh, Aurélie Jacqui. Um, Aurélie's just started uh, in an AI software company called Daisy, um, looking at speech analytics. Um, she's also an active member of Sydney's FinTech ecosystem with a passion for blockchain and AI. Uh, she's a founder of a professional working group focusing on ethics for AI and automated decision making and connects local and international professionals and researchers across industries and disciplines. Now the aim of that group is to define what ethical frameworks should be required for AI and automated decision making. A really important uh, role when we're, when we're talking about um, building these things. She, um, separately from those initiatives, uh, she's working as a senior legal counsel in Sydney, has over 10 years experience in financial services, and also lectured at, uh, in law at UNSW, and before that was a litigator at Allen's and Minters, at different times. Um, next is Helene, uh, Leck, Helene Leck. She's one of the very few lawyers who's earned the world's most esteemed certifications in cyber security. Um, privacy and information security. Um, Helene advises on cyber law, including cyber warfare, uh, cyber security, which we are all uh, are paying more and more attention to these days, uh, uh, protection and defense, uh, information law, information security, privacy and data protection, surveillance, information governance, compliance and risk, and international standards. So uh, her focus is founded on the belief that cyber law is empowering. Uh, so we'll, we'll tease that out a little bit as we go on. Next is Susie Thorval. Do, <laughs> <laughs> to continue the French theme. Susie's a member of the Centre for Legal Innovations Advisory Board and is currently implementing Victoria's new political disclosure laws into the Victorian Electoral Commission, who are responsible for monitoring compliance with the new laws. Before that, she was head of risk in the Victorian Department of Premier and Cabinet. Um, and Susie also practiced law for 14 years. Uh, she uh, says, knowing the level of risk you prepare to accept is a powerful tool. And that risk is something to be embraced. So talking about ideas about risk, the risks that we have in these uh, developing technologies. Next is Belinda Dunstan. Uh, Belinda is an associate lecturer at the UNSW Faculty of Built Environment and a PhD candidate with UNSW Art and Design, uh, Creative Robotics Lab. She received a Bachelor with Honours in Fine Art and Bachelor of Art Education from UNSW. And she's the co-author of a book chapter called Cultural Robotics, a robots as participants and creators of culture. And we'll be teasing out some ideas about um, robots, robot personality, and robot sentience. Right? Um, but firstly, just to the panel, um, where do we see um, AI currently in our daily lives, and, and where might we encounter it in, in a law firm? We've talked about law firm sort of uh, AI and technology uh, today throughout the other panels, but what, what about from the panel? Where have you seen? Not in the mic. Um, so. I think it's always going back to the where do you see AI in the day to day. It depends what definition you have of AI. And as you know, there's about 200 definitions of it. 
um, from many different experts. The definition I like is pretty much the science of automating complex decision making. Um, okay. Very simple. Uh, that was a definition that was uh, brought up in the UK Parliament in the 70s. I think it's still very accurate. So then it's about what is complex decision making. Um, and when you see you use algorithm, which uh, is a decision tree method, this is a way to automate complex, slightly complex decision. For this, we see quite a lot every day. As I say, I used to look after algo traders. You see that um, they use um, to actually uh, decide um, which stock to pick uh, faster than any human could do. Uh, they would use algorithm. That's not too controversial. In the law firm last year, there was uh, a solution provider that was explaining that to allocate matters, um, they could build an algorithm doing that in order to allocate each matters to the relevant lawyers. Um, then you've got the next level up of complex decision, which is machine learning, deep learning. This, um, I've seen um, the pro bono organization um, in the <coughs> government are starting to use machine learning to actually help them because there's a sheer case load and they're actually um, using or testing machine learning as a way to uh, help providing, um, if, let's say in, um, in family case, so the general settlement numbers. As it goes through the case and gives you the uh, response, what's the general maximum amount of settlement uh, money you could get. Deep learning, I haven't seen anyone using it, but maybe I'm happy to hear of anyone here that would be familiar with use case and come to uh, what's called AGI. Um, I'm pretty damn sure we've got a good 20 years to go before we see it. <laughs> Hello. I'll be brave and pick up on that. I brought with me. Um, the Human Rights and Technology Issues paper. I'm not sure if any of you have responded to it. No? Yes? Yeah. Uh, good. Excellent. Do you see it's got a section on, on AI? You probably have. I just want to read um, the two basic types of AI that they're talking about, because I think this is particularly important to lawyers. The narrow AI, and, and you're quite right already, but it's just very neatly put here. Um, uh, narrow AI refers to today's AI systems, which are capable of very specific, relatively simple tasks. Um, such as driving a vehicle, driving this vehicle. Uh, and then the artificial general intelligence is largely theoretical today, and we expect only to see the complex human-like tasks, they would say, between two, uh, 2030 and 2100. So we're quite a way off from that. But I think that this is really important for lawyers as we steer our way through the morass of unknown. Um, I've got a list here, you can tell me if any of them aren't AI. <laughs> Search engines, drones, sat nav, the supermarket checkout, my Fitbit, Netflix, and then watching suggestions of what I might like to watch next. Uh, purchase predictions like Amazon, eBay, targeted advertising that I didn't ask for, it just appears. <laughs> Um, sports journalism, healthcare, the MRI that you might get, and, and the answer it gives the uh, technician. Uh, personal assistants, Google, Alexa, Siri, who adapt based on our preferences, although Siri still can't spell my name right, as I said. <laughs> it's a personal bugbear, I wish they'd fix that. I keep correcting it, it doesn't learn. Um, <laughs> Our smartphone, um, using your face to open your phone, which I don't have the latest iPhone, but it just like, <laughs> frightens me a little bit. Um, 3D printing of food and architecture, ATMs. I mean, is that is that AI? I don't know. It's been around a long time, but that seems like an AI to me. Um, and I believe there's now even a tool for tracking sin. So the Vatican granted a license <laughs> to a company where you can log on and tell it your sins. And, and there's a drop-down menu which gives you the contrition. 
<laughs> you go and say your penance and off you go. Um, one I know in government, um, whether this is an AI, is social media listening, so listening to what the talk is on social media and then making decisions about where government services need to be based. For example, the Morwell mine fire and people saying there's smoke in the air and what's happening in social media and then government responding to that. And so that's in daily life. My list, I don't know if other panellists want to disagree. No, that's... Yeah. that's <laughs> comprehensive. Yeah. Did you have something? No, that's very comprehensive. Um, that's, that's, when you say those things, the, we have all we have those things, right? We have we all have those things. They're all part of our lives now. But who who's who thought before they adopted the, all of those things? Who thought about well, is this ethical? Are we looking at privacy issues? Or is somebody looking at privacy issues? Is somebody looking at ownership of this stuff? What um, what are the risks that we can see? What are some of the risks that that are involved with? Um, with this stuff that's on our laps at, as we speak, as we sit at night, it's on our laps. It's with our children. Um, it's it's in our law firms. Um, as lawyers, we have duties to our clients and to the court. Duties of confidentiality. Duties, you know, we have immense trust. Our clients have immense trust in us. What are we? What what are we giving away by adopting this? Technology, without having thought fully about it. So, what are some of the risks that you foresee in that very long and troubling list of AI? Oh, Anyone? the panel. <coughs> Guess I shouldn't turn it off. Just keep it on. Well, we're giving it our data, and are we fully understanding what we're giving? Um, are we understanding what it's being used for? Uh, we click I agree, but does any even lawyers do we read it? Uh, I, I I took off my Facebook account about oh I want to say it was seven years ago because I had to provide legal advice inside the company I was working and realised the privacy settings were just. I uh, read about the case where a man got some spam email um, which said meet hot young singles and there was a photo of his wife that had been lifted off Facebook. Um, so our data, that, that's the risk. Yeah. And we, we don't even understand. Um, got um, three examples of accidents that already happened. So, uh, Forget AI, we can't even work yes. with microphones. <laughs> <laughs> Getting there. So, um, 2014, Facebook manipulated all its users, um, uh, the content of each of the users, uh, just to see if it could make them happier or more depressed. And they use an algorithm to actually see um, that that would push, um, let's say, um, content and actually the result of the test was actually yes by using the algorithm and pushing the content they would make the user more depressed or happier you can see crossing the dots cabbage and logica how one got to the other <coughs> letting you into that compass software the judge used um, uh, ai software to um, predict um, whether um, Criminals were likely to, that were already in prison were likely to reoffend. What happens is um, the software showed uh, in its recommendation, in its rating, um, uh, showed serious racial discrimination by allocating a higher risk score to black people at a 45% uh, higher level. Um, drones, uh, I invite you to watch uh, a very nice uh, short film from the Future of Life Institute that actually explain, um, well, it's, I used, um, it used to be fiction, but with what um, the US government's currently doing, not sure you can call it fiction, but it's been, uh, this demo explained how you can actually 
uh, using AI technology, um, built um, autonomous uh, drone to actually lock onto you as a target. These are um, both three uh, very um, scary scenario about how not AI is problematic from an ethics perspective, but how human can misuse the technology that is AI. Uh, probably not the best person to speak about this. We do use artificial intelligence in robotics uh, a lot, but I'm sort of more into the robotic side of robotics and yes. artificial intelligence. But um, I do think as well we've begun using this technology, as you say, almost in a um, without realising, and it's not necessarily that some people haven't thought about the implications of it, but many people don't understand um, how it works, and I think there are many interesting concerns raised by a fantastic technology commentator named Sherry Turpin, and she really negotiates a lot of the issues around simulation and authenticity, and um, for me there's, there's a lot of simulation that is performed by artificial intelligence, and understanding uh, the implications of those in our households and even as I watch my four-year-old niece interact with Siri um, and getting confused between what is simulation and what is authenticity um, in advice that comes from Siri or from her parents. Um, I, think, I think there are interesting things there where the technology can quickly roll on without it being properly introduced or explained and um, I, think, I think that's an interesting yeah. issue. So. In 2013, when I came to Australia and started a law firm, um, I was asked by the I was asked by the IAPP still is it good yes. <laughs> um, to write an article on privacy and what uh, personal information meant uh, because they were trying to get more people to join what is the local version of the international the American um, in, um, International Association of Privacy Professionals, and I remember saying that in my view, this is 2013 already in Australia that uh, personal information is the most important kind of information that there is because it is a gateway to good and evil. Now, it's very complicated in Australia because you've got the silly thing called the Privacy Act that has nothing to do with <laughs> privacy. Um, <laughs> in, when was it? A little earlier this year. When was Cambridge Analytica? I forget. It was this year. Yes, we're really deep into this year. I actually put something out on LinkedIn that said this actually proves the point because private or personal information had been manipulated to the point, or people, because of it, had been manipulated to the point that it became an issue of national security. And that's what we're dealing with. And I haven't heard a single mention of information security during this entire session today. And I want to make a point of saying you as lawyers need to go back 20 years. You need to understand that that's where your job begins. That's where information was first recognized and every um, uh, electronic communication and transaction was recognized and the law facilitated the recognition of these things. We need to go back there because the primary things are two things for lawyers. The information has to be accessible for future reference and it has to be trustworthy. It has to be integrous or it is of no value at all. So let's just go back 20 years and incorporate that into everything we do because that's the starting point. Um. A couple of things just on that point. Um, Aurelie, you were talking just earlier about, um, in the other room, about um, data, personal data, being analogous with a, with a limb on your body. It should be treated that way. Do you, do you want to just explain? There's a big debate, in the, at least in the European community, legal community at the moment, it's um, the status of data, right? And it's the same question whether it's on blockchain or um, on uh, for AI, is who are you going to trust to um, hold the data and have use of it? Uh, in January this year, you have an ethics advisory uh, committee for the um, European data um, supervisor. And they provided a report that explained Generally, where they see after the, the GDPR was one step, but where they see the development, and their view was that effectively, um, data should um, your data should not be considered as property, like your car, your house, your 
foam, it should be more considered as a body part, like your hand, um, uh, your kidneys, and therefore, uh, because how could you, how we, as you say, with privacy, uh, there was a survey in the UK and then a few other um, countries that where people say, well, pri privacy doesn't work because you can give me um, the authority to give consent. If I want to use Facebook, it's a monopoly. And if I need, like for me, I, I do from overseas, um, the best way to get in contact and the only way to get in contact except for the phone um, is to, and to have a regular update is to actually go on the Facebook platform. So consent is not protecting me. However, if you um, change the status of data to consider it more like a body part, then this data should only uh, use gratuitously for um, for good reason, and that's up for government to build up those good reason. I'm going to respond to that. I had to come to Australia where I kept, chose to come to Australia, and then I had to reconvert in order to practice law here. One of the subjects I had to do was property law, and we had this marvelous professor Cameron at Sydney University. And lesson number one on the first day of property law was: you're riding along on your bicycle, you get hit by a car, your arm is severed, your arm's lying on the grass over there, and you want your arm back. Someone walks past, picks up your arm. Question: Can you get your arm back? Answer: No. You don't own your body parts. And there is, a long, there is a long series of legal precedent to support this. It becomes very complex when you begin to say, can a wife get the sperm from her deceased husband and so on. So there are nuances to this. But I'm very interested, and I gave a talk in the United States last year on law ethics and the Internet of Things, because I think that we're looking at possibilities such as accession and chips in body parts and cyborgs, where we will be seeing accession. And I'm very keen to see how we look forward to interpret law. I mean, after all, um, unauthorized access actually stems from trespass, our property law. So we should be thinking how we apply what we've got. I have lobbied both DFAT and the federal government for changes. Um, the federal government is far more, in fact, they, they're writing a lot of laws. I've got samples all over. Um, but DFAT is not. DFAT is more and more saying we don't need new law we need to work with what we've got. And that means we as lawyers need to try and find cases, look for declaratory orders, and try and make sense of what we've got. Michael, can I just throw a hack into this fear <laughs> and say, what's the risk of not using the technology? Because I think, I think that's an important question to ask ourselves. If, if we don't... Yes. Embrace technology. Yeah. It'll leave us behind. Yep. And what's what's the risk there? Well, what is the risk? It, it, is um, our lawyers um, uh, going to be uh, negligent if they don't use computers to assist their practice? Um, computers are now getting to the point where they're far more accurate and they're far faster than humans at, at doing certain tasks. Um, if something's more accurate than a human, then shouldn't the, shouldn't the human use the machine? Should, should a doctor use a, a robot, uh, like a robot, um, to, to help in its surgery? Or would you prefer the, the surgeon to get back in there the old fashioned way with his arm up your... Up, up your sleeve, up your stomach, <laughs> 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 get your appendix out. Which would you prefer? And what is the risk if we don't if we don't um, trust the machines? Yeah, there's just there's no situation where there's zero risk. There's risk of getting out of bed in the morning. There's risk of staying in bed. Yes. Right? The solar flare could come and kill us all. So mm -hmm. you've you've got to live. You've got to work. You've got to progress. And I think. You know, obviously you have to do it in a, in a smart and considered way, but I don't think any of these lawyers can hide from technology. Clients will demand it yep. um, and they'll need to use it because otherwise clients will go somewhere else. Yep. They want cheaper services. They want an augmented answer. So do we, do we just have uh, better insurance and, <coughs> and better um, disclaimers? Yeah, there are, there are risk controls like that. And I think um, 
the leadership of law firms need to be getting together and thinking strategically about where they want to head. Yeah. Defining their appetite for risk yeah. in a serious way, including what's the risk if we don't do anything. Yeah. And, and going from there. I just, I just want to point out here that we've got this really interesting abjective tendency to polarise technology and humans. Um, as though technology is this collection of runaway train of artefacts and systems, where in fact, at its purest definition, technology is human activity. That's what it is. And I think we got a great example from Stevie this morning, who showed us all of these stages of human technology from inscribed stone tablets right through to blockchain. Really, technology is human activity. It doesn't exist without our needs or attending to our desires. It doesn't exist without us um, implementing it, building it, allowing for it. It's not um, an invader from outer space that's out of control and going to take our jobs. It's, it is it's human activity. Um, so I think it's, it's kind of important to retain that sense. Uh, there's a lot of uh, fear-mongering, I think, around technology, particularly robotics. I, I hear about it all the time, but it, it, at its core, it's human activity. So remaining responsive to that, remaining engaged with that, is not. It's not really. Uh, it's not really a choice. I think. I think it's we're inherently involved in it, whether we like it or not. Well, I think that's a crucial point, which is that engagement with this is is what we need to do. We need to. We need we're to in it. Yeah. Keep engaging, right? We need to keep talking. We need to ask questions about ethics. We need to ask questions about whether this is a good thing or, or is this what society wants? Is this, you know, when we are asking these questions, we have to, we have to keep these conversations going. Um, and is that where we're left? Is that what we can do? It, well, or it sorry, just add to. I could not agree more uh, with Belinda. Um, the risk has got nothing to do with AI. Like you keep hearing. Oh, is AI going to kill us, or is um, AI is going to take all our jobs, or uh, is going to rescue us from uh, the end of the world because of the problem we have with the environment? This is really, really not an AI question. It's an ethics question. It's the people that are building the code into the AI, or that are actually uh, deciding what purpose they're going to use AI for. Are you going to use it for to derive patterns to actually help cure cancer, or are you going to use it to derive pattern to actually um, manipulate elections? <laughs> That's most sense. we back to, with AI, we back to the basics of the most human problem. What society do we want? What values do we want? What ethics do we want? And as lawyers or technologists working in a law firm, I think that should be the number one concern at the moment. Or yes, go with uh, I work at the university, so I bought you something to read to you. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think it's really interesting, and it sort of links with what Susie was saying about continually, um, and actually Helene mentioned this as well, continually developing our thinking um, and the law in response to technology. Um, this is an amazing book uh, <laughs> by David Gunkel. It's called The Machine Question, and it's sort of talks a lot about all of these issues and there's just like this fantastic paragraph in the back of the book that I was going to claim as my own but I just, you know, it's not, it's not ethical. So <laughs> he says, in other words, the machine is not just another kind of other who calls to us and requires a suitable moral response. The machine puts the questioning of the other into question and asks us to reconsider without end what a response means. So I think in essence, um, Gunkel here is saying, you know, we are responsible for ethics. We don't respond to some external body of ethics. It must remain fluid. It must be turned over. And it's our responsibility to engage with it continually in relation to changing technology. Is it on? <laughs> yes. It's keeping us humble. I think, I think it's beautiful. <laughs> and I completely agree. It is about civilization. It's not about law. It's not about tech. It's actually about what kind of civilization do we want to be part of? Um, I think I think that's the biggest thing. But to go back to the question that was initially framed to you, um, what happens if we don't adopt it? Um, I think 
the really important thing is that we're dealing with changing norms within society. Um, and part of that relates to risk because if you don't get to the program or keep up with the program, you're going to be backwards. And any doctor who does what you said will be in trouble. That's right. <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to keep progressing because there are norms and that's where all your director duties come into being and all your common law uh, you know, requirements in terms of you know, due diligence and due care come into, into, into play. So you can't not move at the times. Yeah, if government can put cabinet documents in the cloud, sure, <laughs> the <laughs> whole firms. I thought, you, I thought you were going to say if, if government can put government documents in the cabinet. <laughs> in the cabinet and, <laughs> and shut it put it in the truck. Yeah. <laughs> no. no. Um, good. Now, um, talking about lawyers, we're, we're talking about, we're, we're all, most of us lawyers. Hand up if you're a lawyer or. Yeah, okay. Um, there, there is a worry already out there that lawyers, that machines are going to take our jobs, right? The machines are going to, and you listen to Suskin and Suskin, you listen, you listen to this AMA. Um, you know, the, the law, uh, lawyers' work can be um, compartmentalised and then reproduced by a machine, right? And that low level sort of uh, work can be done by a machine. And you see reports of junior lawyers' work being taken the most, right? Which hollows out the leverage at the bottom of the period, right? And, and then hollows out the profit for law firms. And lawyers, the lawyer's response is, well, we're, we're humans, you know, clients want to come and see humans, right? And we have that, we have that affect, and we have understanding, and we have sentience, and we have all of those human qualities that machines can never do, so, you know, that our jobs are safe. But what, Belinda, <laughs> you work in design of robots, okay. right? Um, will we one day be able to program those things into robots, or simulations, or artificial elements, artificial constructs of those things. It doesn't matter if they're not human ethics or human emotions or human... What if, what if they're artificial ethics and artificial emotions and artificial... They, but they do the same thing. Can we, will we one day be able to, to do that? Uh, look, it's difficult for me to come in on the future potential possibility of simulating um, simulating emotions to, a, to an extent that we accept them um, with, without differentiation from, from human emotions. However, um, the question about robots taking our jobs, yep. um, I get all the time, people asking about this all the time, and I really have to say it's um, that us first, them, robots taking our job, us all of them, is not at all what I see in my research. Um, I look every day at um, emerging examples of social robotics, so robots that work in human environments, uh, in the home, in workplaces, in nursing homes, and what I see uh, more and more is examples of collaborative robotics. So I'll just I'll give you two examples. The first one is robots that work in nursing homes in Japan, where there's an early retirement rate of nurses because they are struggling from repetitive strain injuries from lifting patients from the bed. So they've actually designed a robot that helps to lift the patient out of the bed. And as the robot is lifting the patient, the nurse can get in beside them and hold their hand. And they're able to do the human part of the task, whereas previously they were concentrating on bending their knees and holding them back in the right position. Another example is um, in Finland, there's a robot dessert chef and he's working in a particularly busy restaurant where the restaurant initially had dessert chefs that were creating unique pieces every time that would go out to the, to the customers. But the restaurant got so busy that they ended up making the same dessert over and over again. And here we see an example of human behavior becoming automated, becoming robotic <coughs> in order to deal with um, an excess amount of demand. So now they've got a robot in there that spirals the chocolate on the plate that was the most time-consuming part of the job. It runs a little algorithm and it spirals a different uh, pattern every time. And now the dessert chef has time to respond creatively every time in response to what the robot's doing. So it's actually returned the most creative, spontaneous part of the dessert chef's job to him 
um, because the, the part that had become automated was taken by a robot. And these are just two very disparate examples, but they actually really reflect the truth of what I see in my research, is that robots are taking up the, um, there's, there's jobs that robots are great at and jobs that they're terrible at, they're great at doing maths and terrible at climbing stairs, and um, we're great at the, the other way around, basically. So um, I think that increasingly I'm seeing jobs being taken up, parts of jobs being taken up by robots, which are really um, good for robots to do, and they are allowing people to return to the most human part of the work that they do. So I, if I were to extrapolate on what I see in my research, I would suggest that that might be the future of how artificial intelligence could contribute uh, in a legal sense, that it is allowing robots to do the sort of grind work of whatever it is that is part of your career, and allowing you to return to the most intuitive, abstract reasoning, creative, empathetic part of your job.